10 years ago, we were pretty much the only ones talking about it. We were absolutely excoriated in the fall of 2001 for saying that we thought the dollar was going to decline for 10 years. Somebody asked if we make a prediction. We put out a press release. I think that's a reasonable way to state your opinion. And I think we, got, we won that bet. And we will put out another one because we think that's going to continue for the next five to 10 years as well. But the liquidity, this is a Minsky crisis. Excess liquidity in a market drives asset prices irrational, and it's that simple. And ultimately, there's a crash. We think there's continued excess liquidity in the federal budget deficit. Money supply expansion, something not everybody thinks about. Remember the old petrodollar recycling we saw in the 1970s? This is trade deficit recycling dollars coming back into the country and changing our behavior. And just the fundamental borrowing behavior of the American consumer. And this is a charming couple. You never know where, quite where the uh, graphics group comes up with pictures sometimes. But this is a charming couple. I'm going to tell you a little story about them. I want everybody here to vote at the end. If you ever make a big mortgage company, you make a lot of mortgage loans to a lot of really qualified buyers. So we're going to have you be at the credit committee here and tell me if you want to give this charming couple a loan. Well, first of all, they make $250,000 a year on their W-2 income. Yep, not a bad, not a bad uh, couple. Starts out pretty decent. Okay. They have a lot of other assets. You know, some of them are in stocks and bonds. Some of them are shared with family and in trust. And so they have some substance behind it. It's a little hard to get it. They have an outstanding loan, million four hundred thousand dollars. Not unusual, is it? Probably a lot of you at one point in time in your life before you paid it off with cash, buy gold, had a million four outstanding on your house. So what does that mean? It's about a seventy-five hundred dollar a month payment, ninety thousand bucks a year, thirty-six percent of their W two income. Any votes now? It's kind of a normal loan, right? Want to make that loan? Yes? No? No. But you're with me, the, the mortgage, Manny, Freddie, and everybody else will make that loan. Um, I think it should be 50% down. They were crying in their uh, press the other day about homeowners having 20% again. Well, there's one more fact that these individuals forgot to tell us. They spend $370,000 a year. <laughs> but our clever mortgage representative ferreted this out from but you know, that's a little bit, I have the math wrong here because they have another number down below, but it's, it's $120,000 gap, right? But they say, great, when you make us the mortgage loan, we cut $20,000 off our spending. What do you think? A little better? Okay, now, can everybody, everybody here multiply by $10 million? I'm a banker, I get to deal with zero, so multiply this by $10 million. So a country comes in to finance its deficit. Tax revenue, 2.5 trillion. Outstanding loan, 14 trillion. That number is kind of stuck in our head. Remember 10 million, 14 trillion divided by 10 million is a million four. Total spending, 3.7 trillion. The best proposal I've seen out there is for $200 billion a year cut. This looks hauntingly familiar. Now just imagine you're the Treasury Secretary and you're going to talk to your lending officer, a gentleman named Pooh. <laughs> I think you get the picture. We love this little graphic. We have the, uh, the, the projected revenue on the left, the deficit on the right, and the two Republican and Democratic proposals sitting there by the side of the pipe band. We'll just go through that quickly. And of course we all know it's a debate about who started. I'd rather see who ends it. Uh, than anything else. So it is about political choices. Your elected government, you know, a client of our stuff, I say, what would I like to ask Graham Paul? He said, can you, in a real politics sense, get anything done in this market? Because here's how the balance of life we have three choices. You cut spending, a lot of talk about that today, but really, people, we all need to go back to our congressmen and say, no, that's not enough. It just doesn't work. We think it should go to about 10% of GDP over the next 10 years. The total spending cut that anybody has proposed, if put in one year, would get you there, as opposed to the 10 years. 
You can raise revenue. Nobody likes that. You get a lot of booze and cat calls, but those are your only two serious policy options. Or, if you're elected, you can borrow the money and ask somebody else to pay it back later. How are you going to stay in office? Let's take a wild guess. Let's take choice number three. Okay. So where does that take us? The political approach says it's the government's job to fix the economy. You heard that earlier this week. Mr. Obama said, well, it's not all you people worry about are professionals. We'll take care of it. That's what we're worried about. Leave it to us. And I think, as I said, that they're cutting total spending over 10 years uh, about the amount that I think we should cut in total. Now, we have a couple quick Federal Reserve notes. This is, uh, Tom Honig from Kansas City. We love him. He's retiring. Talking about the current recession, the United States has suffered the, because of Fed policy in the middle 2000s. Now here, I'm, I'm ashamed to say, being from St. Louis, the St. Louis Fed was the monetary Fed. They were the ones who told you that money supply was the, 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 the absolute keys to the kingdom. Well, James Bullard, who was the president of St. Louis Fed a couple weeks ago, talked about QE2 and how wonderful it was. Because real interest rates declined by market manipulation. Inflation expectations rose. This is a good thing. Really. The dollar depreciated, despite a strong dollar policy, this is good. And equity prices rose. Well, if you dump enough liquidity in the market, guess what? And, of course, overnight, the dollar started to get killed again because they're talking about doing this all over again. I can't believe they call this a success, but they do. And the Fed, of course, is looking at this graph to determine whether or not to cut back on quantitative easing, while the rest of us are looking at this graph in terms of what is the real cost of living? All those items on the, as you can see, are the things that impact us. That number on the right is measuring inflation. Now, Larry Myers, former vice chairman of the Fed, said, oh, don't worry about the short-term stuff. It's the long-term. Well, I went back and calculated the long-term things, Larry. And I think 10 to 20 percent uh, inflationary cost increases on a compounded annual basis over the last 10 years is a little high for me. I'm going to move a little quicker here. Um, by the way, I have a workshop tomorrow afternoon at 1.30. We will be a little more complete with this. But our view summary is really simple. We're going to have more, one to three more years of housing problems. Commercial real estate issues, extended U.S. dollar volatility. We've seen a 5 to 10 point move in the euro over the last couple of weeks. And definitely in the three to five year area, we're going to have a downward acceleration in the U.S. dollar. And 1.30, uh, we're going to get down to business in the global marketplace. Now, really quickly, we're going to get a little bit down the road. The currencies are relative values. They're all fiat currencies. None of them are worth actually anything. As Doug Casey likes to say, they will eventually go to their intrinsic value. And it's just a combination of relative budget situations, relative debt levels, relative current account levels, and relative growth prospects. And currencies created these long trends, changed by the Volcker situation, the Plaza Accord, the Gingrich Clinton era where the dollar got stronger, and of course the Bush budget for 2002 began the current dollar decline. And I think you can see these go in extremely long trends, and it's our view that this one on the far right is going to continue for another three to five years at least. Now, gold, the bottom yellow line is actually the gold price has moved since. Uh, for the last uh, 11 years versus, in red, the peaks that we had in the early 80s and, of course, the NASDAQ and the blue. So currencies you consider, again, go up or left. The ones we're really focused on, on, on asking you to look at are Norway. Oil currency, commodity currency, heavily uh, buttressed by that. That position. Australia, another situation where China is simply digging up the entire country and shipping it to China to build things. That's going to be good for the Australian economy. Canada, resource and a little bit better government, not great, but I think it's a good place to be. Singapore, it's a new one added in this year. China, and for a more speculative person, you might want to try a little bit of Brazil. Now, Chip is hanging on my right shoulder here. That means my time is up. And thank you very much. Come to the workshop tomorrow. We'll have a longer discussion.